Hello from ABA Annual Meeting 2018 in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lawrence Coletti. I'm Daniel Hemmel. I'm Adam Fuller. Maya Ewing. Heidi Roll. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. And we're back. Thank you so much for joining us on the road. It's a pleasure to be here in the Windy City. Uh, how many nicknames does Chicago have? I counted a few. City of Big Shoulders. I have no idea. No idea. Yeah, I thought I thought it was Windy City was the way to go. Well, there's a few, and then there's there's Chai Town. But my, I think my favorite was uh, what Frank Sinatra called it, "My Kind of Town." <laughs> nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. You all were part of a uh, speaking session here at ABA Annual, and what was the title of that? The title of it was "The Future of Arbitration." Is it so bright we have to wear shades? And that was an homage to which band? I have forgotten already. We did a pregame on this. <laughs> Tim Buck three, a one hit wonder, but a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, catch there. So, but uh, no, I love the title of it. Definitely attracted me when I was looking at the uh, the lineup for the the different sessions. So, congrats on the title, and uh, let's get started on that. But before we uh, tear into the topics that you guys discussed, let's learn a little bit more about you. Where do you work? What do you do? Who wants to go first? I'll start. Uh, Maya Ewing. I am with Allstate Insurance Company. Um, I've been in house there as their employment and benefits attorney for about 17 years. All right, who's next? I'll go next. I'm Heidi Roll. I'm a regional claims manager at Star Adjustment Services. I specialize in employment claims. I've been doing that um, for different insurance carriers for about six years now. I'm Adam Fuller. I'm a partner at Brennan Mana Diamond in Akron, Ohio. I'm an employment attorney. I'm Daniel Hemmel. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Law School, and I've been teaching for three years. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's get the 50,000 foot, just kind of general synopsis about your speaking session. So, who wants to volunteer for that one? I'll go first. So it, the presentation was really about the Supreme Court's recent decision in Epic Systems v. Lewis, which is uh, three consolidated cases from various circuits around the country uh, that deals with uh, whether uh, arbitration agreements in employment contracts uh, are permissible if they disallow class actions. Okay. so. We did a little, uh, we did a little pregame on the front end here, and so, and I asked you this pretty obvious question. You guys answered it excellently. My understanding is that employment contracts have had arbitration agreements for a very long time. So, what happened here? What's let's go through the nitty gritty, just walk through it step by step. What's the change with this? So there was a, an agency that said no, we don't like arbitration clauses, and then now the Supreme Court says yes, we do. So let's walk through that process. The National Labor Relations Board under the Obama administration took the position that arbitration agreements in employment contracts that prohibited class and collective actions were a violation of the National Labor Relations Act of uh, 1938. Uh, That decision was reversed by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, though the Seventh Circuit here in Chicago and the Ninth Circuit uh, on the West Coast uh, agreed with the NLRB's position. All of that got to the Supreme Court and the court voted 5-4. Uh, taking the employer's side against the employees in the National Labor Relations Board, ruling that you can have an arbitration clause that prohibits class and collective actions in an employment agreement. Was this determined by Justice Kennedy? Was it a swing vote decision here? It was actually uh, Justice Gorsuch, and uh, it was his first published opinion. Is that right? Uh, He had written an opinion in his first term on the court, but it's, I think, the most significant Gorsuch opinion so far. Well, let's talk about it. so. So now we're at a point where the Supreme Court backed a little bit the business side here. So, what are the uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages to this decision? So, from the company perspective or the employer perspective, I should say, um, what this allows you to do is really begin to look at ways the arbitration clause being one to reduce the soaring legal spend that you have associated with these class actions. There is an opportunity to eliminate one or two class actions a year and see a significant decrease in your litigation spend. And how about some of the disadvantages? Well, from an employee's perspective, if you're an employee and you should be making the $7.25 federal minimum and your employer is only paying you $7 an hour, Perhaps you can bring a collective action where you bring your 25 cent per hour claim with 100 other similarly situated employees, and over the course of a year of pay, that adds up to enough to get a lawyer to take your case. Uh, If you have to litigate that 25 cent per hour claim on your own uh, or arbitrate it, 
outside of a courtroom, that's going to be really hard to do. Absolutely. And, and from an insurance company perspective, when we get a claim in, we look at whether there is an arbitration provision, whether we think it's going to be enforceable, how successful we'll be on that and even getting it into arbitration to begin with, and whether it makes sense from a risk management perspective to get it away from a jury or whether we want to have a more robust discovery process as you would have in litigation. Now, you all had some interesting statistics about arbitration, kind of a trend there, just a little bit about some of the Fortune 100 companies and and how that plays out. So as of today, about 80% of Fortune 100 companies are utilizing some type of arbitration clause in their employment agreements. I think with the Epix decision, you're going to begin to see more and more companies begin to introduce them into their workforce, assuming that they think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. And so I'm pretty familiar with the use in employment contracts. It's been my exposure to it. But there are other areas of law that the arbitration clause gets in there. And so I know that we're kind of getting outside of the court decision. But you know, what is some other information regarding that? Well, in the employment context, arbitration has been used in the baseball salary context uh, for quite some time. In fact, there's a type of arbitration referred to as baseball arbitration. Outside of uh, employment, uh, and remember, baseball players are employees uh, of their teams. It's routine in commercial disputes, business versus business litigation to go to arbitration. Increasingly in consumer contracts, uh, in your cell phone contract, uh, in your Apple terms of service agreement, uh, it's quite likely that there's an arbitration provision that requires you to go uh, before a non-judicial body uh, to bring your claim. Yeah, and in the employment context, there's a lot of different claims that you can assert, right? The EPIC decision dealt with wage and hour claims, whether you're entitled to overtime or not. But you could just as easily have a sexual harassment claim that um, would have to go through the arbitration process rather than be tried by a jury of your peers. So that's sort of the push and pull here. So we started in employment contracts, but um, you know the recent decision, the recent Supreme Court decision, do you think that that's going to expand the footprint? of arbitration clauses. We're talking a little bit about consumer. We're talking about uh, sexual harassment claims, but that's kind of back into uh, employment. Uh, but do you, do you imagine that this case will be used kind of as a lever to expand the, what's covered by an arbitration agreement? You might actually think of employment as sort of the last bastion of areas of law that had not been covered uh, contractually by arbitration clauses. Uh, back in 1925, uh, Congress passed the Federal Arbitration Act, which required courts to enforce arbitration clauses in a whole broad range uh, of contracts. And the, the lingering question resolved uh, in May was whether that applied to the employment context, too. Is your prediction that Judge Judy is going to be happy with this decision? <laughs> I believe she's technically an arbitrator, so yeah, she'd probably be pretty happy. She'd More get some work business. for Judge Judy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> instead of just having disputes with your spouse or your children uh, litigated in Judge Judy, uh, litigated before Judge Judy, you could now have uh, cases with your employer go there. And those are interesting cases. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's additional fodder for her and her producers. All right, so what are some of the other hotbed issues and attorneys that kind of circle in these waters? What should they be aware of today? Well, what, one thing that um, you have to really look at is the state response. And also at a law school level, what different employers are going to be doing and, and how uh, employees react to, to the decision. And I, I know Daniel's got some interesting anecdotes about how this has played out in the law school context and also in the state area. So law students uh, are not fans of this decision uh, for the most part. They went to law school thinking that they would be able to seek justice in court, and now they're told that an employer can rip that away from them. Uh, so we've seen actually a groundswell from law students trying to discourage arbitration clauses in agreements between law firms and summer associates and associates. The University of Chicago, my employer, and 49 other law schools have signed on to a new policy where they ask employers who want to recruit on campus, will you make your employees, will you make your associates sign arbitration clauses? The firms are disclosing that uh, to students before they interview on campus. And almost all of them are saying, no, we're not going to do this. 
Corporations are looking at the advantages um, with respect to um, reduced cycle times. Oftentimes with um, massive class actions, they extend on for multiple years. Um, also, one of the other advantages is confidentiality. Um, if you are a large corporation that is concerned about your brand reputation and the media in connection with a large class action, this is an opportunity for you to have a more confidential settlement. And in some respects, from the insurance company perspective, it's also a finality of when you resolve it, you're, you're finished then at that point. You're not worrying about the, the lag of claims down the road. Now, one employer that did use arbitration clauses in its employment contracts was the Weinstein Company. Uh, and ultimately, that did become public, but the clauses required confidentiality, uh, while Epic Systems was, I think, one step forward for employment arbitration. Uh, the Weinstein revelations were also a big step back. It definitely put these clauses in a different light. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a really interesting discussion, and we're running short on time, so I just have one more question for you. If our listeners, they want to reach out, they want to talk with you, learn a little bit more about what we discussed today, how can they find you? Why don't we start with Heidi? Well, I'm uh, available on LinkedIn, and i um you know, reach out whenever you want. LinkedIn is a great resource, so feel free to reach out. Also on LinkedIn, um, Brennan Mana Diamond is a law firm. You can just look up the website. I'm at D-H-E-M-E-L at uchicago.edu and on Twitter at Daniel J. Hamill. Great. Well, we've reached the end of the road for today's episode, but I want to thank our guests for joining us today and also our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please find us and rate us in Apple Podcasts. See you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.